<clears throat> Thank you. That's our sound check. Um, uh, this morning, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the, this conference, uh, Brigham Young University American Councils, uh, for inviting me. This has been a great trip. It's my first time outside the airport in Salt Lake City. And Utah, it seems, is much prettier outside the airport in Salt Lake City. <laughs> this morning, I'm going to be talking about high-level language. Uh, I'm going to use examples from Arabic, from Russian, and from English. Uh, I almost said Chinese because I want to wish all of you a happy Spring Festival, a happy Tet, uh, which is today. May the year of the horse be good for all of us. Um, so happy Lunar New Year to everybody. Uh, I'd like to begin my presentation by doing a report to you uh, on what we did at the Foreign Service Institute, what we have done since September 11th, 2001. Uh, very soon after September 11th, uh, it was clear to the State Department that while we had a couple of people, we didn't have enough who could go on Arabic television, who could appear in, with journalists, who could be interviewed on Arabic TV. As we said back in the early part of this millennium, we didn't have anybody, or we didn't have many people, who could do crossfire in Arabic on Al Jazeera. So our charge was to do that, and that meant bringing some of our, some of our students up to the four level in Arabic or on um, actual parlance to the distinguished level, which is the level above superior. I'd like to share with you how we did that. First express thanks to Castle for supplying really great support to us. We had a couple of conferences, we had some symposia, on what it meant to be a high-level speaker of Arabic. We worked with our Geographic Bureau, NEA, the Near East Bureau, and they came up with four things that they wanted from their high, highest level speakers of Arabic. They wanted them to be able to appear on camera. They needed to be able to speak on the record. They needed to be able to speak on highly sensitive topics, and what that means is on topics that the audience was not going to be happy to hear. Sometimes people don't like U.S. government positions. And finally, they had to be able to do that to a broad audience. <clears throat> and as we've worked with this, we've found that the challenge of speaking to a broad audience is really the hard challenge. Uh, the, others are, the others are fairly doable. So I would like to start by showing you an example of one of our distinguished level speakers. This is Michael Pelletier, who is our spokesperson at our um, office in Dubai. Uh, this is the highest level language requirement that the State Department has. So here we go with Michael Pelletier. <laughs> أعتقد نعم أعتقد إنه يعني في تركيز خاصة على عملية السلام بين الإسرائيليين والفلسطينيين وبين الإسرائيليين والعرب بشكل عام وفي تركيز كمان على الحوار وعلى المفاوضات والمحادثات وأعتقد إنه هذا الشيء مهم ومثل ما قال الرئيس الجديد خلال خطابه أمس إنه يركز على يعني الاحترام المتبادل والحوار وأعتقد إنه هذه الرسالة رسالة مهمة so, for those of you who are Arabic speakers, if there are any here, you may have heard that Michael has a bit of an American accent. Um, he's not making some of the distinguishing vowel sounds that uh, we work with our students on. There's a, Arabic has three T's and three H's. He's mixing those up a little bit. On the positive side, and especially if you were to watch all of his performance, Michael is very good at switching from register to register. He's extremely good at using the kind of metaphors that uh, Arabic audiences feel uh, are, are essential. Michael has the ability to reach out to that broad audience. Well, how did we get to this from where we were in 2001? And I'd like to take you back to the beginning, at least the beginning for the State Department of the Proficiency Movement. Uh, for us, proficiency began in the mid-1950s. 
Uh, and the charge was from Congress at the Foreign Service Institute often, you know the expression it takes an act of Congress, but the Foreign Service Institute often it actually does take an act of Congress. And the act of Congress said that the language State Department officers needed to learn had to be useful language. Um, and I think that that is still our prime directive, that we are working with useful language. For the first 10 years, proficiency scales were not very well defined. As a matter of fact, they were moving from a scale of 11 to a scale of 6 to a scale of 5 and, and feeling their way around. In the mid-1960s, the first set of proficiency standards were created. Over the next 20 years, it seemed that those were not specific enough. In the mid-1980s, the uh, proficiency standards were rewritten. Um, and they gave us, in the mid-1980s, the benchmark or the ruler uh, against which we worked. And that was that our ideal was the highly articulate, well-educated native speaker. <coughs> As I was preparing this talk, I thought it might be interesting to sort of take this apart, to unpack this term. Uh, and I started with native speaker. I called David Argoff, um, PhD Berkeley in Linguistics, our erstwhile associate dean for Washington instruction, and asked David, is the native speaker, this term as it was applied in the mid-1980s, uh, is this term a riff on Chomsky's ideal native speaker? David said, no. <laughs> Chomsky's ideal native speaker was a sort of platonic ideal creature who could create an infinite number of grammatically correct sentences. That's what they weren't interested in. What they were interested in was what the linguistic community was talking about in the mid-1980s. David suggested I read a book called Is the Native Speaker Dead by Pikeaday, um, published 1984-85, republished recently, where there was an online discussion on the native speaker. Uh, Pikeaday brought together some 50 linguists, including Noam Chomsky, uh, lexographers and other language professionals to ask the question, is the native speaker dead? Those linguists in the mid-80s agreed that the function of the native speaker for contemporary linguists was that the native speaker was able to judge grammaticality of utterances. That's what they were looking for. Beyond that, they didn't agree. It, who is a native speaker? Do you have to be born in a country and grow up speaking the language? There were lots of examples of people born in the country but who then moved, or people born out of the country who then came in, who uh, they thought wouldn't, wouldn't match up to being native speakers. Next question. If you were bilingual, could you be considered to be a native speaker? Many of the linguists in the room in the 1980s would have excluded everybody in this room from the category of native speaker. Why? Because there's some leakage. Leakage of your second language back to your first. You may choose words differently because you're bilingual. You may use a grammatical construction differently because you're bilingual. Next question. What type of language did you speak? Could, as they said in, in the book, could you, if you grew up in Ireland, could you be considered to be a native speaker of English? A study was cited where a number of utterances from London were sent up to, or a number of study, uh, sentences from Ireland were sent down to London asking people whether were these sentences done by native speakers, which raises the question of what is the standard language? Extremely interesting question. And the next one, who gets to pick? which dialect of the language is the standard language. That, in, that discussion takes a very interesting turn in Pike Day's book. One of the linguists noted that a publishing house, doesn't say which one, a publishing house in New England actually found a black and a Chinese who could pass for native speakers. <coughs> Somebody else said, hey, wait a minute, that's illegal. And one of the Canadian linguists said, well, we've got laws against that in Canada. And somebody else responded, you know, native speakerness is not as easy to identify as handedness, gender, and sexual orientation. 
For handedness, gender, and sexual orientation, they said, you can tell just by looking. <laughs> okay. If we had this conversation at the Foreign Service Institute in 2014, we could march about half of the panel straight off to EEO court. Huge problems with that. At the end, the observation was that the term native speaker is extremely tricky because it can be elitist, it can be racist, it can be sexist. There's a power thing that goes on with the term native speaker. Well educated. In 1980s, this group of linguists agreed that well educated meant an individual with a bachelor's degree from a reputable institution. They didn't say how you determine which institutions are reputable and which ones aren't. And I think in the mid-1980s, I would have applied for one of the disreputable institutions. It would have been more fun. But they didn't say that. When I, when I mentioned this to some of the people in the ILR testing committee, or test, not committee, testing community in the Washington area, they said, oh, no, that can't be right. The standards for well-educated are much higher than that. And I said, well, what are they? And there wasn't a definition. Which brings us to the very tricky thing that goes on in the testing community. I know it when I see it. Right? I know it when I see it, I would argue, cannot be a standard for us, especially when people's jobs, people's pay, or students' grades are attached to the results. And then finally, I promised a little bit of aporia. Here we are, highly articulate. I have no idea how you can define highly articulate in a way that we're going to get inner rater reliability in a way that could be objective in a way that the courts would agree with. But wait, there's more. Outside the ILR skill level descriptions, there is a community of discussion. There are some common thoughts, and I'd like to pick on just two of them. Uh, one is that you can level a performance by these four terms, fact, opinion, concept, that's the way we say it on the East Coast. On the West Coast, at DLI, they add to the top of that theory. The argument is that facts are the easiest, theories are the most difficult, and you can, you can level by looking at that. In our discussions about that, several people have said, well, doesn't this sort of line up with Bloom's taxonomy, where Bloom actually does give us a way to level student performance? When I design a course at Northern Virginia Community College, I am required to align my courses with Bloom's taxonomy. But if you compare Bloom's taxonomy to this fact, opinion, concept theory, you very quickly see that Bloom is talking about verbs, we're all linguists, right? And that the ILR is talking about nouns. Okay? That's a huge difference. Under Bloom, if you can describe something, which is fairly low level, you can actually describe a fact, you can describe an opinion, you can describe a concept, you can describe a theory. Analyze, much higher function on Bloom, and you can analyze a fact, you can analyze a concept, analyze an opinion, analyze a theory. Okay? This gives us something where all of a sudden this approach to the ILR skill level description starts to fall apart, and there's one more thing. At the Foreign Service Institute, we train people. We don't educate people. The people, in other words, it is not our goal to help people develop critical thinking skills. If you do not have critical thinking skills, you are not a Foreign Service officer. That's one of the terms of employment. So we are entering this with a student body that is capable of doing the critical thinking stuff that I work on at Northern Virginia Community College. They just need to learn the language. When you come at language that way, all of a sudden, proficiency looks very different. I'm going to read to you a, um, which I have right here, he said, hopefully. Okay, I'll tell you about it. Um, Richard Feynman, um, who has the Nobel Prize in physics in the mid-1960s, uh, got it, by the way, the same year that Sholokhov did. Uh, Mid-1960s, talks about learning Portuguese. Um, he got a, a, a fellowship or a grant or an invitation to work in, a, in an institution in Brazil. And so he worked very quickly with a local 
Portuguese speaking graduate student, learned Portuguese, got on the airplane, discovered that he couldn't understand the people around him. When the plane stopped for a rest stop, this was the mid 1960s, so they had rest stops, um, the people on the plane told him, well, that guy over there speaks good Portuguese. So he went and sat next to that guy over there and discovered that he was a neurosurgeon um, who had been doing some research at the University of Maryland. He found that he could have a very interesting conversation about neuroscience, about neurology, because the high-level words were easy to move from Portuguese to English. He could handle all that high-level abstract theoretical stuff when his seat partner turned and looked out the window and said, the sky is blue, he said, I was totally lost. Um, there is, I was trying to find it, but there's an interesting article that, or piece that was put in a Slavica publication about 20, 25 years ago um, from uh, one of our colleagues teaching Russian at MIT. One of the physicists at MIT came to her and said, I need to go to Moscow to a conference, teach me Russian. She came to class and she had all of the introductory survival Russian stuff. He said, that's not what I want to do. He came with some articles on theoretical physics that he wanted to read as his big entry into Russian. He had written all of them. It was a translation of his own work. For him to enter the language reading his own work in a new language was easier than if he had to start back in the beginning, which we would assume is the one level. So his entry point, like Feynman's, was up there sort of at the top in the theoretical range. Well, I want to move forward with this conversation and talk to you about high-level, high, highly articulate, well-educated native speakers. And I've picked a group of people I think we can all agree meet that standard, no matter what your position or theology is. We're going to look at some people who've won the Nobel Prize, and we're going to look at what they sounded like at the Nobel Prize luncheon. So these are highly educated. You don't get the prize without that. Highly articulate, you don't get the prize without that, and they're speaking to a select audience um, that is at the highest levels. So we're going to start with uh, Mahfouz, who's the uh, first Arabic writer to win the Nobel Prize. فمن الواجب أن تسبح أنغامها في واحتكم الحضارية لأول مرة. وإني كبير الأمل أن لا تكون المرة الأخيرة. وأن يسعد الأدباء من قوم بالجلوس بكل جدارة بين أدبائكم العالميين الذين نشروا أديج البهجة والحكمة في دنيانا المليئة بالشجن. Okay, Mahfouz himself did not travel to Scandinavia to receive the prize. It was read for him. So I don't have a recording of Mahfouz actually reading this. This was read by Dr. Taj al-Sir al-Raya, who's the head of our Arabic program. When I showed this to a fairly large number of Arabs, the response was the same. That is, this is the pinnacle of Arabic. This is as high as it gets. This is what they call fusa, or, or pure Arabic, formal Arabic. And why is it beautiful? It's beautiful because in the first line, there's a, a, there, there's a metaphor, which seems to be very important. The metaphor is, um, may the sounds of my language swim into the oasis of your culture. The use of the word oasis in this context <coughs> struck the heart of every Arab I had uh, read this text. In the second part, I'm, I'm, I have a handout that you'll get afterwards. Uh, the, uh, there's a translation of this. In the second part, there are some contrasts, some beautiful contrasts. There are not very many low frequency words, but there are a surprising number of collocations, unexpected, beautiful collocations uh, for, uh, for high frequency words. Everybody swooned at this. Um, Mahfouz very seldom gives, um, gives interviews. I found one of them. And I found one, fortunately, where he's talking about our issue. And that is really the issue of what language do we consider to be the standard language. Arabic, we had a lively discussion last night, by the way, at the wonderful reception, uh, about dialects and what's happening with dialects in Arabic. It's the hottest question right now in Arabic language training. Mahfouz is talking about that. And he's going to say that my generation of writers uses standard Arabic, uses pure Arabic, because we're trying to reach out and elevate the broad Arabic audience. But when I want to address 
specific individuals, when I want to talk on an emotional level, when I want to reach out to someone's heart, I'm going to use uh, local language. I'm going to use AMIA. So if you're not an Arabic speaker, you get to learn two words in AMIA, and we're going to do a listening comprehension test here in a second. And that is, <coughs> Mafus is going to use the word Fusa. He's going to use the word AMIA, which means local language or dialect. Listen for that. Um, he's talking about standard Arabic versus local dialects. Okay, Mafus is arguing for the importance of the Fusa, the high level Arabic, because of its unifying abilities. He's making this argument in Egyptian Arabic. So this whole clip is done in Amiya, not in Fusa. I'd like to take you to a comfort zone. We're going to do something in Russian now. Uh, look at or listen to Joseph Brodsky. This is the Nobel Prize in Literature from 1975. And here we go. <laughs> чем мучеником или угасителем дум и деспотии, оказаться внезапно на этой трибуне большая неловкость и испытание. Okay, so what did he say? Um, here's the text of his script taken from the Nobel uh, website. Um, and I wouldn't pretend to interpret this for you, for, for this audience. Uh, you all know all of this stuff better than I do. But what I would like to do is show you what's difficult about this for my students, uh, particularly at the community college and even for some of our students at the institute. First thing, Russian does a lot of stuff that English doesn't do. The first problem is that adjectives uh, don't come where they're supposed to. They say they can come after the nouns. They can sometimes come in different places. So we're going to switch the adjective around to make this a little easier. Next, this second sentence actually is going to turn out to be one of the second part here, this clause, one of the hardest parts, uh, and it's right here. Uh, and the real problem is right here, etusiu, right? Um, even Google Translate, I've had this thing translated every year for three years. Google Translate is getting better. I'm going to give you a copy of the translations over the years. But it cannot handle etusiu, right? Uh, if we do this, if we split those words apart, now it makes sense. Um, this, this privacy through the whole life. Okay, now we're doing okay. Next problem, well, the form is a form that Russian students get a little bit later in their, in their studies, but it sure is a long way away from that noun that it's modifying way up there in the beginning. So we can simplify this by saying and now we're making Brodsky much more comprehensive, comprehensible to our American students. The uh, language expert, um, I just dropped his name, uh, the one who does process instruction. Anyway, he would argue, Bill Van, Patten. Uh, Van Patten, Bill Van Patten. Bill Van Patten would, would argue that this is the kind of text that we should be working with for our students because uh, what it does is force our students to make mistakes. And if we can force our students to make mistakes, grapple with their own mistakes and correct them, that they'll actually learn all that grammar and structure stuff in a way that's much more effective than, uh, than um, talking to them. Next thing Brodsky does, um, my ninth grade English teacher said never do this. He uses the same word in one sentence. He actually uses the same word three times. And each time he uses the word, it's a little bit different. Um, this makes it really, really hard. We also see some very low frequency stuff. Um, uh, and so this is difficult, hard 
rush, and it's difficult because of the length of the sentence, it's difficult because of the sentence structure, it's difficult because of the position of the words in the sentence, and it's difficult because of multiple meanings for words, low frequency meanings for high frequency words, and some just low frequency stuff. We're going to switch to, as we did in Arabic, look at the Nobel speech and then look at something else. We're going to switch here, but I'm switching uh, prize winners. We're going to look at Sakharov, who won the um, Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. But we're going to watch him doing something that has become very important to us at the Foreign Service Institute as we train high-level speakers. And that is the ability to dress, address a hostile audience. So here we have Sakharov. He's talking to the army. Uh, this is not a warm reception from the army. And what I would like you to do in this, besides listening to his words, you'll see that he's going for shorter sentences. He's using clear, high-frequency words. And he also stands himself firm. And he moves a little bit forward. He himself is bracing himself for that attack. OK, so here we have Sakharov, Nobel Peace Prize 1975 addressing a, a, a hostile audience. There's a no, another Nobel Prize winner sitting right behind him when he does this. <laughs> Я меньше всего желал оскорбить советскую армию. Я глубоко уважаю советскую армию, советского солдата, который защитил нашу Родину в Великой Отечественной войне. Но когда речь идет об афганской войне, то я опять же не оскорбляю того солдата, который проливал там кровь и героически э, выполнял свой приказ. Не об этом идет речь. Речь идет о том, что сама война в Афганистане была преступной, преступной авантюрой, предпринятой... Э, э, предпринятой неизвестно кем, по неизвестно... Неизвестно, кто несет ответственность за это огромное преступление нашей Родины. И это преступление стоило жизни почти миллиону афганцев, против которых, против целого народа велась война на уничтожение. Миллион человек погиб. И это... И это то, что на нас лежит в страшном, страшном грех, грехом, страшным упреком. Мы должны смыть с себя именно этот позор, этот страшный позор, который лежит на, на нашем руководстве, вопреки народу, вопреки армии, совершила это, этот акт агрессии. Так вот, что я, я, выступ, я выступал против введения советских войск в Афганистане, и за это был сослан в Горький. Именно это послужило главной причиной. И я горжусь этим. Я горжусь этой ссылкой в Горький, как наградой, которую я получил. Это первое, что я хотел сказать. Okay, that's Sakharov. Um, Sakharov addressing a very hostile audience. And what I'm interested in here is, I mean, what he says is fascinating, but what I'm interested in here is how he says it, how he reacts to that hostile audience, and what we can learn from that. We've been at FSI talking to the communications people, the public speaking people, and how we train people when they get in this sort of situation where the audience is very, very hostile. And that's something we absolutely require from our uh, highest level speakers, particularly in Arabic. Now we're going to my comfort zone. This is John Steinbeck. He's absolutely one of my favorite writers. 
One of my pleasures being here in Provo was I went out for a walk my first night, saw the big football stadium there. Right next to the football stadium, there's this real cute, quaint, used bookstore. So I have this image of people coming out after a victory, uh, coming out and flowing into the used bookstore because there are just wonderful old books. There's, there's not the, 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 the kind of junk we find in used bookstores in Washington. There are classical novels. There are books of the philosophers. It's a great store. And they had a couple of volumes of Steinbeck, so I bought them. Um, here's Steinbeck at the Nobel Prize uh, Literature in Prize Literature in 1962. Um, and he's going to end with, I think, one of my favorite sentences in English. For finding my work worthy of this highest honor. In my heart, there may be some doubt that I deserve the Nobel Award over other men of letters whom I hold in respect and reverence. But there is no question of my pleasure and pride in having it for myself. It is customary for the recipient of this award to offer personal or scholarly comment on the nature and the direction of literature. At this particular time, however, I think it would be well to consider the high duties and the responsibilities of the makers of literature. Such is the prestige of the Nobel Award and of this place where I stand that I am impelled not to squeak like a grateful and apologetic mouse, but to roar like a lion out of pride in my profession <laughs> and in the great and good men who have practiced it through the ages. Literature was not promulgated by a pale, emasculated critical priesthood singing their litanies in empty churches, nor is it a game for the cloistered elect, the tin-horned mendicants of low-calorie despair. Literature is as old as speech. It grew out of human need for it, and it has not Okay, so what did he say? Literature was not promulgated by a pale and emasculated critical priesthood singing their litanies in empty churches nor is it a game for the cloistered elect, and I love this phrase, the tin horn mendicants of low calorie despair. This is something I say in the shower now. The tin horn <laughs> mendicants of low calorie despair. I ran this through the readability formula, and the fog index tells us that this one takes 20.66 years of formal education to be able to understand on the first reading. 20.66 years for me would have been halfway through my doctoral dissertation. Uh, past the master's degree, past my undergraduate work, this is high level stuff and this for me is just absolutely gorgeous. But not all of Steinbeck is done there. Um, Steinbeck in his writings writes very differently. These are the opening lines or the opening sentence from Cannery Row and look at what he's doing. Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, a quality of light, a tone, a habit, a nostalgia, a dream. And he's given us here a string of nouns. These nouns are all high frequency, they're all short, and the way he's pulling them together is both poetic and powerful. As a matter of fact, often the short words, the monosyllabic words, are at the pinnacle of communication. To be or not to be. Gorbachev said, or not Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. George Bush said, George W. Bush said, I hear you, MacArthur, I shall return. Arnold, I'll be back. <laughs> Short sentences, very powerful communication. It's not high frequency stuff, but it's a high level of communication. Well, I have another clip of Steinbeck. This is still, I believe, at very high level of communication. Here he's talking on the phone. He's talking on the phone with a man who was, at one point in his career, a professor of speech, uh, taught speech and communication. But when he's making this conversation, he is, uh, the man he's talking with is President of the United States. Hello? Hello. John, how are you? I'm doing good. I got your note, and I've just been trying to locate you, and they got you on the line. I hope you're doing all right. It's uh, awfully nice of you to call. We're seeing our other boy. He's in training.
heading here to the Port Ord now. That, and with the lane and me in Saigon, it makes 100% of the migration. Well, it looks like I'm going to have to come out there then and make it 1,000%. We can do it. Are you feeling all right? You did awfully well before. I saw your picture in the front page of Ovita's paper, the Houston Post, this morning. And she says she's going to get some first-hand reports from you. Well, I do hope so. Uh, Mr. Spadden, I smell a little dawn. Is that incorrect? Well, we 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 think it's uh, it's uh, there are good possibilities. We never can be very optimistic because we never know. But uh, we think that uh, it's getting better every day. It smells that way. We think that the one thing that helped a good deal was that they they thought the elections would uh, be helpful. They were not, and uh, we think that. Uh, uh, it's an endurance contest, and uh, they have about concluded they can't win, but I don't think they know where they, which way to go from there. Yeah, well, the, the people, our friends from the north are having a little pressure now, too. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, is there anything I can do for you there? No, except take care of yourself and don't be too damned adventuresome. Oh, uh, I've got to do that. Well, you just... Uh, remember, I complained right from the very beginning that reporting in this war was done by very unadventurous of reporters. Uh, Lane and I got to have somebody to take care of us in our old age, though. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll do what I can. Lady Bird, Lady Bird sends her love, and we look forward to seeing you when you get back. And we to her, and Elaine sends, says she sends her love to all of you. How are you feeling, Mr. Brothers? Feel pretty good, pretty good. I've been having some trouble in my eyes since my operation, but I think they're going to get all right. Thank you, John. Thank you for calling. Bye. Bye. Now, back in the 1980s, this, this would have been, um, this clip would have led to a, a real wild discussion uh, in the testing community because there, there were those who were arguing that texts themselves are leveled and that since this is a sort of chit-chat phone conversation that this would be a low-level thing. Um, and I wouldn't agree with that. Um, I think what we see here is John Steinbeck at the Nobel luncheon speaking in one kind of language, John Steinbeck using another kind of language when he's writing, John Steinbeck using culturally appropriate language here when he's talking with the President of the United States. I don't know for you, but if the President calls me, I'm going to have a heart attack uh, at my desk. But talking with the President and being able to strike the tone that's appropriate for that conversation. The president's language, I would also argue, is high-level speech. It is s probably a studied and well-maintained regionalism. Uh, Johnson's being from Texas was very important to Johnson. But that doesn't, the fact that he's speaking like he's from Texas, doesn't exclude him from high-level speech, at least not anymore. Um, at one point, people said in order to speak high-level English, you had to sound like you were on TV. You had to sound like Tom Brokaw. Uh, Tom Brokaw speaks Canadian English. He was born in North Dakota. Um, so that means to be a high-level speaker of English, you have to be from Canada. Um, wouldn't agree with that. It's the ability to adjust your language to a broad audience that gives us that high-level speech. I have one more example. And this is from Ada Yonat, who has the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 2009. She is from Israel, and she is speaking either a form of international English. We, I don't know what her native language is. It's possible that her abilities in English are native. Um, chemistry in Israel is studied in English. So she's doing most of her work in English. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was doing this, I looked at the web I looked at the Nobel Prize. I looked at the performance of every Russian-speaking Nobel laureate. And I found something very interesting. The prizes in peace and literature, the speeches were done in Russian. The prizes in all the other areas were done in English. So if we take my hypothesis that we can use the Nobel uh, conference as the mark, the benchmark for high-level language, then high-level Russian is English, and we can close the conference, and we can all go home, right? Um, here's um, Ade Yonat um, at a conference, not the Nobel laureate conference, but a Nobel conference. 
and my family, especially my granddaughter. Why do I say it? I say it for the young women that sit here. It's possible to be scientist and a beloved family member. Look what she wrote here. The grandma of the year is Ada Yonat. There is no year. I asked her, why there is no year? She said, every year you have to re-prove yourself. <laughs> so they love me, but they are also very demanding. Please, young ladies, go into science. It's a lot of fun, even without prizes. And that's what happened to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I would, my position is that this is also very, very high level speech. Um, you could say, but she made two mistakes. She dropped a, an indefinite article, and she didn't invert an embedded question there. She didn't swip, flip the, the subject and the verb like she's supposed to do. When you heard John Steinbeck at the Nobel Laureate Conference, he mispronounced the word promulgate. He calls it promulgate. I have looked all over all kinds of dictionaries, even dictionaries from England, to, to find a dictionary that would, would say that it was okay for him to say promulgate. I haven't found it yet. It may be out there. But he possibly made a mistake there, promulgate, or promulgate instead of promulgate. But if you look at the response of the audience here, you don't see anybody saying, Ada, you missed an indefinite article, right? I did. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> you forgot to invert your sentence. She is communicating effectively, and one of the keys to her communication is her ability to find those short words, the short sentences. She said, young ladies, go into science, it's a lot of fun, even without the prizes. Very effective. It gets across a very important message, and the audience response was, was very, very positive. So I, pro I promised a um, platitudinous postlude for my thing, and here it is, that as we've been working, as we've learned in the last decade about high-level language, we've discovered some things. One is that our concerns are not the concerns of the linguists of the mid-1980s. We are, for the most part, not concerned with grammaticality. A few mistakes are going to be inevitable. What are we concerned with? We are concerned with our students' abilities to reach a broad audience. This means many registers of speech. Our students' abilities to stand in front of a hostile audience and to hold their own and our students' abilities to find a way to reach out to the hearts and souls of the people on the other side of the TV camera or that one-on-one -on -one interlocutor in the elevator, that group of students at the university that they're working with. It's the ability to communicate. It's the ability to communicate to a broad audience that is exceptionally important at the highest levels. Grammaticality takes a second, third, or fourth row seat. So thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>